readings of the day. In this video, we shall discuss about bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis is most common lower respiratory tract infection and it is usually seen in infants and also children less than or equal to two years of age. You know the most common cause is respiratory sensation virus although it can be caused by other viruses such as human meta pneumovirus, adenovirus, influenza, rhino and para-influenza viruses. The pathophysiology involves always any infection will cause inflammation of the lower respiratory tract with the resultant edema epithelial necrosis and this, it, this irritates the underlying uh, vasculature and dermatitis which will cause bronchospasm and also increases the mucus production within the bronchioles and this results in varying degrees of air trapping and sometimes due to absorption of the air there may be atelectasis or hyperinflation of the lower airways. The increase in the airway resistance and development of lower airway obstruction results in increased work of, work of breathing. Because the nasal passages account for 50% of the total airway resistance, increased nasal mucus production may cause upper airway obstruction due to small nasal passages of the infants. And this in itself can cause a modest respiratory distress, particularly in young infants who are obligate nasal breathers. So, the respiratory syncytial virus is transmitted by direct contact and with the contaminated secretion because it is highly infectious, self-contamination and also common spread are common. So hand washing and contact precautions are important to limit the spread of the disease. So when you see the incubation period, it is usually the, the around 7 to 21 days is the normal symptoms and they are worst in the first week of illness and normally the peak appear occurrence will be in North America is from November to March and typical symptoms would be rhinorrhea, tachypnea, wheezing and coughing and use of accessory muscles due to respiratory distress and also nasal flaring and fever may also occur and these symptoms will last for around 7 to 21 days and are worse than the first week of illness and the peak may be between 3rd and 5th after onset and associated symptoms might be irritability, cyanosis and poor feeling and a subset of infants with bronchiolitis will develop severe disease and apnea. The apneic episodes may be brief and self-limited or progress to more frequent and prolonged episodes that lead to hypoxia and need for endotracheal intubation. And some infants, some infants presenting with apnea have minimal other symptoms. So several factors associated with the uh, with a greater risk of uh, severe disease and apnea. And as you can see, the risk for severe disease may be with in infants with bronchiolitis may be pre-existing risk factors or acute risk factors. The so pre-existing risk factors include prematurity, less, less than 37 weeks gestation, especially less than 30, 32 weeks gestation period, age less than 2 months, underlying cardiac or pulmonary disease and immunodeficiency. And in acute risk factors, oxygen saturation less than 91% and increased work of breathing as, uh, as evident by the physical examination with the retraction, nasal flaring and grunting and also dehydration that is observed or reported for feeling and apnea also. So these are the risk factors. So with these risk factors may have a prolonged hospital stay, one thing. And second thing is that there is a great need for the mechanical ventilation. And in these patients, as, as they have multiple, you know, uh, high, they have higher mortalities with these complications. So consider bronchiolitis in, in, in infants with apparent life-threatening events and monitor such infants closely. On chest examination, wheezing and crackles are heard diffusely throughout both lungs. Respiratory rates should be measured for one full minute and may vary normal to profound tachypnea. Okay. So the axillary muscle use intercostal or subcostal retraction develop as a respiratory stress worsens. And patients with bronchiolitis are at risk for 
dehydrational blocked nasal pa passages you know inhibit the feeding while increase work of breathing and higher metabolism can contribute to increased insensible losses assess for signs of dehydration include dry mucous membranes tachycardia lethargy depleted capillary refill and adequate urine output and sunken fontanelle and these should be done because patient won't be having good proper nutrition because of uh, the insensible losses and also other parameters should be checked while examining the patient so how do you diagnose a bronchiolitis bronchiolitis is type is a clinical diagnosis based on findings of history and physical examination which includes typical symptoms of rhinorrhea tachypnea crackles and wheezing wheezing in the child less than 2 years of age there are several published scoring systems for assessing the severity of the illness and change over time used for research purposes although none has been validated or gained wide acceptance in clinical application obtain pulse oximeter readings at presentation to detect hypoxemia that may not be readily suspected on physical examination and repeat readings during the course of the ED visit should be done uh obtain intermittent oxygen saturation monitoring for the children with mild disease and continuous monitoring for a moderate or severe disease and rapid viral antigen testing detection are not helpful in the diagnosis of bronchiolitis but should be considered in certain clinical situations and viral testing should be performed for patients on respiratory sensation virus prophylaxis presenting with bronchiolitis and in this situation the presence of rsv or infection may warrant discontinuation of the prophylaxis for the rest of the bronchiolitis season and viral testing should also be considered in the context of a planned admission for the purpose of patient cohorting and infection control so the ancillary blood work and radiographs are not routinely needed unless other diagnoses need to be needed to be excluded and the incidence of the serious bacterial infection in infants less than 28 days with bronchiolitis and fever is 3 to 10% similar to that in other in neonates and with fever so the standard test of blood urine and species of is indicated and in which more than 30 years of age 30 days of age uh, the incidence of serious bacterial infection is associated in association with the bronchiolitis remains 3 to 5% so you can see the difference less than 20 8 days means 3 to 10% and more than 30 days in the incidence is 3 to 5%. So the chest radiographs are not routinely indicated but may be considered when illness is severe or associated with hypoxia and when pneumothorax is suspected and then only you should get a chest x-ray done. And uh, it may demonstrate atelectasis, bacterial pneumonia and focus can be helpful in assessing the bronchiolitis and focus can be used by clinician to identify pneumonia, asthma and pneumothorax and may also helpful in identifying patients with more severe bronchiolitis so in 2014 american academy of pediatrics published an update practice updated clinical practice for the treatment of bronchiolitis in the children aged 1 to 23 months that highlights some of the challenges clinicians encounter in inpatient and ed setting main interventions recommended for the treatment of children with bronchiolitis is symptomatic support measure as upper airway obstruction is often a main issue for the children with bronchiolitis and the most important treatment is frequent installation of you know saline into the nares followed by suction mild dehydration should be managed with more frequent and uh, smaller feeds and use of pre-feed suctioning and if there is any concern for a more significant dehydration options include temporary support with the nasogastric feet or iv hydration in children with respiratory distress requiring respiratory support iv route is favored to reduce the risk of aspiration and the evidence behind the most common interventions to reduce the respiratory distress is you know we'll discuss later on so the when a patient is presented to ed then we have to assess the patient's respiratory and the physical and uh, exam do a take a brief history and do a physical exam if the patient appears well then no criteria met then nasal suctioning as required 
and the caregiver education should be done and should be explained about the signs, symptoms and natural history arranged for early follow-up with the primary care physician and discharge the patient home. And if the patient looks like a mild to moderate bronchiolitis, then nasal suctioning with normal saline should be done and intermittent pulse oximetry. It, as it is a mild moderate, we can use uh, intermittent pulse oximetry, then assess for the hydration and if the patient is dehydrated, then supplement with IV or NG feeds. Uh, assess the response. Observe for two to four hours. Then assess feeding. Then assess admission admission criteria. Persistent oxygen requirement. Apnea monitoring. Then fluid or nutritional need and inability to care for patient at home. Then we need to admit the patient. If the patient on examination, initial examination, looks have a life severe or life threatening apnea, then aggressive nasal suction should be done. Intermittent continuous pulse oximetry and also supplemental oxygen maintaining the saturation of more than 90% should be done and assess hydration and supplement with IV on NG as necessary. Consider epinephrine nebulization that is 0.1 solution like 0.5 ml and 3.5 ml NaCl every 1 to 2 hours should be done. Consider dexamethasone 1 mg per kg combined with epinephrine. If there is an improvement then you can follow this algorithm. Or if there is no improvement, then we have, we have to get an ICU consultation or a transfer to the tertiary pediatric uh, hospital, consider an IV or intubation. And one or more criteria will then consider admission in the uh, inpatient unit and after the admission criteria has met. So there is no role of any bronchodilators, you know, uh, you know. So hospitalization rates or no benefits have been shown on oxygen saturation and hospitalization rate or duration of the by using beta tokenus. And they should not be given an inhaled uh, epinephrine does not reduce the rate of rates of uh, admission. And although some studies suggest that it may provide temporary clinical improvement when used in ED, and therapy should not be routinely used but may have a role in the management of children with severe or acutely deteriorating bronchitis. And in case of cortisol, the combined use of dexamethasone and uh, epinephrine decreased admission rates in a multi center. Canadian study, however, recent meta analysis incorporating these data with the other studies on the topic did not confirm this association. Therefore, combination therapy should not be used routinely for the treatment of the patients of the children with bronchiolitis. So, there is no literature to support the use of systemic or inhaled corticosteroids alone in the treatment of the bronchiolitis, and most adults adverse against it. And the data on the effect of uh, hypertonic saline in bronchiolitis are mixed. Hypertonic saline may improve mucociliary clearance by loosening the mucus plugs through osmotic draw of the fluid from the submucosal and uh, adventitial spaces. The preponderance of the evidence suggests no meaningful clinical benefit from nebulized uh, hypertonic saline in the ED. And the 2014 American Academy of the Clinical Practice recommends against its use. So, if the patient deteriorates and uh, they might require non-invasive ventilation such as high flow nasal cannula, oxygenation, nasal continuous pressure, positive pressure, pressure and bilevel positive airway pressure may help avoid or delay the need for the endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. And guide continuous CPAP is more effective than respiratory support tool. High flow nasal cannula is better tolerated by children and may be sufficient for the patients who require support but do not have the evidence of impending respiratory failure. And when the patient, majority of the patients can be discharged from ED and educate the caregivers about the regarding the signs and symptoms of increasing respiratory distress and dehydration and tell them to bring the child for immediate re-evaluation if they develop uh, respiratory distress or dehydration, demonstrate proper nasal suctioning techniques to caregivers, counsel parents that symptoms may persist for up to three weeks to help avoid unnecessary ED returns for the persistent mild symptoms. And Factors should prompt consideration for administers administration. And infants with one or more of these risk factors are at risk of requiring more significant intervention should at least be observed for a period of time in the ED. Alternatively, infants without any risk factors can be safely discharged home, assuming that there are no social concerns and that adequate follow-up can be advanced. Factors such as sex race, a duration of the symptoms, parental history of the asthma, and prior ED visits are not related to safety for the discharge. Thank you very much for listening carefully. See you soon.